thank you, Rachel, for you know, founding Dare to Run and, and again, to the board that I'm sure keeps everybody uh, focused and, and really trying to fulfill the mission. So yeah, there was no ever any question, just so people are very clear, there was never any question in our mind as to whether or not we were going to continue our, you know, legislative roles. I think a lot of the question was swirling around out there uh, my colleagues had always known that it was my intention and our intention to come back, but we also want to keep our eyes on the ball. And right now, uh, in this world, New York is the epicenter uh, of the COVID crisis in our country. And I just don't think that people, you know, realize what that means to each and every one of us who have the privilege of representing people in New York. So here we are with, you know, almost 400,000 cases, the most in the country. And the ability for us to stay focused right here in our districts, in our constituents' day-to-day -day needs, which I think some of us heard uh, the early discussion that I was having with Assemblywoman uh, Rosenthal, whether it's unemployment, whether it's, it's getting food, you know, basic food to our constituents, whether it is keeping people from a state of panic. Because mm -hmm. again, we've got more COVID than everyone else. Whether or not it is making sure that the PPE is there, that people understand, you know, how to actually access it and how not to contaminate yourself when you use it. I mean, I'm, she, every single one of us wanted to be the steadying present in a very scary situation. And then, you know, obviously the information had been very, very uh, spotty and it had also uh, change from moment to moment, day to day, who could get it, who can't get it, and so on. So in addition to our role, and let me go back, because on March 2nd was the first time that we even addressed COVID, and both the Assembly and the Senate came back, it was the first time that I, as leader, had actually called our members back into session. We had gaveled out for the day, but because we were seeing what was happening in terms of COVID and how quickly we looked at, uh, you know, the, the possibility of a pandemic, we decided to come back into session and to a, pass a $40 million package at that time, again, it was March 2nd, and give the governor some ability to be flexible in terms of his dealing with COVID. Again, that was March 2nd, two and a half months ago, seems like a lifetime. In between that, we were able to, to do quarantine, uh, quarantine paid sick leave. We were also able to do a budget, a budget that was scary then because we didn't know really whether or not there was any ability to, to, to meet the terms of this budget as we continued to see the economy unravel and shutdowns and so on. But, we were able to hold fast with a budget that held harmless, which again, you know, is almost a cut to our education system, but with the billion dollars that we got from federal, from our federal partners, et cetera, we managed to hold education harmless, to, to push back on hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts in our healthcare system and create a vehicle by which at least we could say to New Yorkers that we are willing to lead, we have a steady hand, and we will do what we have to do. So, so kind of this is, and since then, we've obviously done everything from making it easier for people to vote. Again, it is a constitutional change, and we had already begun the vote by mail process, and Senator Biagi will certainly, you know, talk about that, but, but we had to make temporary changes and adjustments. So while we were, and that was just, you know, April 2nd when we actually physically left, we've been holding remote uh, meetings, conferences, and the last 
you know, we, we've held two hearings with the assembly, one on small businesses and one on the disparate impact of COVID on minorities. So uh, in addition to all the things each and every one of us are called on every day to, to help our constituents weather this storm. So yeah, we're going back next week it'll be virtual for the most part i will be up in albany some members will come up if they can but we still have the capacity to vote virtually to do the business it will be covid related bills to try and alleviate some of the stress and uh we will be doing it day to day week to week as as you know people need for us to do our work wherever it is thank you so much you mentioned in your answer about how receiving federal federal funds it helped us with the education kind of balance it because even though technically it was cut uh, able to replace those funds from federal yeah. and I and I know that you had a conversation about going forward um, as we see the impact that we as we take kind of an assessment of the full impact of COVID-19 financially and fiscally for our state that we're still relying on what's going to come from the federal can you help us understand a little bit about the role of the federal government in helping New York overcome the impact of COVID-19? Yes, yes. Uh, and I, I mentioned it, and I, again, I should have uh, shouted out, especially against Senator Schumer in that, because initially when that package came, there were no dollars for state and local governments. And uh, he really pushed back along with Senator Gillibrand and our congressional delegation to insist on including money for state and local government. So here we go again. When we got that money, we got a certain amount for the state itself. We had a certain amount of money for education. There was also, I didn't mention, but you know, small business money, unemployment insurance, and so on and so forth. The reality is, is that we states have to balance our budget. We cannot pretend that there's money there that isn't there. We want to, and like I said, I, I'm wearing, wearing my shirt uh, of all of my, my members who are women. Uh, there are 14 of the 40 in our uh, Democratic majority, which has never happened before. There's 63 members uh, and 19 are women, 14 are, are where we are. So I just wanted to, to, to put that out there so that people know that in our house, in our majority, there is an incredible number of women, certainly as it relates to what has happened in the past. And we, along with our very smart male counterparts, are looking at, at how we can manage the budget, bring forward the kinds of priorities that we know that certainly women bring to the table, and how do we make it make sense? And the thing is, we can't make it make sense. We have a limited amount of resources, an infinite number of needs, and certainly with COVID, it has become you know just just astronomical. So we need the federal government that has the ability to actually not balance the budget. They can print money. They can do all kinds of things that will infuse resources into we states that have to balance our, our budget. I want to be clear, people like tax the rich, so on and so forth. I'm okay with looking at a bunch of different alternatives. My, my committees have been working to look at what we might be able to do, but there's nothing that we can do within our state that would fill the gap, which is now at least 13 billion with a B dollars. And the governor projects over the next few years about $60 billion. So the federal government has the ability to give us as much money as we need to you know, defer uh, you know, interest rates, to print money, to make it work for us. And New York, uh, as hard hit as we are, we know we have the capacity to come back and come back strong if we get the right help. Uh, thank you so much for talking about um, the budget, right? I think the budget's on everybody's mind. And so I wanna give the opportunity to some of our other panelists sure. to address the budget as well. And I know Senator Biaggi, uh, you had mentioned that the way we spend money is a reflection of our values. 
And right now we're hearing that maybe there just isn't that much money. So how do we prioritize and make these decisions? So I just want to hear about your thoughts on the recently passed budget and what the long-term impact uh, that's going to be. Okay, so first of all, thank you for having me. I am excited to be joined by so many women um, who are leaders um, in the legislature and then in, our, in your own right. Um, having more women run for office, I have to say this before I begin to answer your question, having more women run for office and win and be at the table, there's nothing like it. And when you're sitting there and you're talking about a policy, you can see how impactful it is and how important it is because a female's voice, a woman's voice is a different voice than our male counterparts. And it's not to say that we don't need our male counterparts, but we need both to reflect the realities of the world. And I've actually watched as, um, as, as we've had discussions in the past almost two years where you know, there's blind spots for some of our colleagues because they don't experience the same things that we do. And so it's really exciting just to see so many women and also just to continue to encourage so many. This year we have so many more running in New York. So fingers crossed that we have more women win and that we get a super majority, please God. And so just, I want to make sure that I am very clear about where I stand on that. Okay, so the budget. So, um, I mean, the majority leader just, spoke a lot about you know, the different pieces of where we are right now. This is absolutely unprecedented, and I don't think that we ever could have imagined uh, when we were in the budget process or when we began the budget, pro budget process in January, um, what we would be facing right now. Um, I was not in any type, type of delusion or illusion that this would be easy. The budget is never easy. Um, we have a very... Um, imbalanced um, set of power when it comes to the budget process. And so when we walked into the budget, right, we had a $6.1 billion deficit. And at the time, to be perfectly honest with you, I mean, that number is a very large number. And for many people, it's a very large number. And I think many of us thought to ourselves, oh my gosh, like this is, this is a very large number. What are we going to do to bridge that gap? Now we're, we're at a $13 billion deficit. It's only growing higher. And so I think that what it's, it's doing is showing the urgency of the fact that we have to have the three levels or the three branches and the three levels of government working together. It's city, it's state, it's federal. It's all of us coming together in a way that we could actually bridge these budget gaps. And so, in, listen, in my time serving from last January to now, um, I have learned it's painful. So I'm not going to lie here. You have to compromise. Um, it's inherent to the legislative process. It's part of it. Um, it is a lesson that enables me to choose what fights are worth taking on. You can't fight every single thing. It's just not worth your time. It's not also, it's not also doing justice to each issue that comes in front of you. And so this year, I mean, I understood that there were deficits, as I said, compromise played a central role. Listen, if you looked at all the budget bills that we voted on, I probably could have could find a reason in each one why I was against it, right? Like, Every single one had something where I was like, really, are you kidding? And this is because, again, we come to the table as, a, as the legislative body with the executive branch of government and in 49 other states, in 49 other states, I cannot emphasize this enough, the branches of government are co-equal during the budget process. In New York, because of a quirky and very powerful court of appeals decision, Silver v. Pataki, the legislature doesn't have the same amount of bargaining power and it's, it is painful every single time. So we do what we can, we push really hard. And you know, in, in, from my mouth to God's ears, we will be able to overturn that court case through um, a constitutional amendment. But we all fought, every single one of us this year fought very, very hard. We made it very clear that we wanted revenue raisers because we knew that in order to balance the budget, we would have to have additional revenue. Now, obviously, in order to be uh, to move forward, I think it's clearer to more people, um, and even in, in the ultra millionaire bracket and class of people who have, by the way, made money during this during this crisis. Right? I, I keep calling them pandemic profiteers. It almost sounds like ridiculous, but there are people who have made money during this pandemic that can afford to pay a little more. Right? They can afford to to um, pay a higher tax rate and. It's important to focus on that because the last thing that we want to do, especially as a state, is to put an additional burden on the middle class, our lower income individuals who are strapped and struggling more than I have ever seen in my life. 
I think we have like a record number, not I think, I know, we have a record number of unemployment. Um, we have a record number of people who can't pay their rent. I'm sure we'll get to that too. But the point is this, our state budget is the, is the policy document. It is the most important document that we make a decision on every year that does reflect our values. And so you could take it line by line. You could determine that there are you know, good things and bad things. And I think at the end of the day, each year that we push a little bit harder, um, what we see is a little bit more of what the, what the majority of people in the state of New York actually want to see in that budget. But it's not an easy process. So I don't want to have any illusions towards that at all. Thank you so much, Senator Biagi. Now, I know that the budget is a topic that both Assembly uh, women, Rosenthal and Fernandez want to speak about. However, at this time, I want to move forward because there's so many different topics. Or maybe we'll come back to it if there's something else at the end of, the, of our conversation. Uh, in the chat, someone mentioned about Bronx response rates to the U.S. Census, to the census. So I want to give Assemblywoman Fernandez the opportunity of talking about like what's at stake here, why is it so important for New Yorkers, especially those vulnerable communities that are mostly impacted by COVID, to, uh, to complete the 2020 census. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Dejecta, she's actually my constituent, um, for bringing up this really important topic because now more than ever, it is so, so important that every single person walking these streets in this city, the state, uh, fills out, the, in this country, fills out this census. And why is that? Because the census, un, it allows the, the government to understand our communities, to see what we're made up of, what, who we are, where our, our standings are, um, and it helps create the formula that the federal government needs to create, um, I guess, the budget to provide for us, you know, to help funding for our schools, for our roads, for the fire department, the police, for everything that just happens and works in our society is because what the census um, has been able to, 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 I guess, fund for us. So, you know, now more than ever, we really need to, to show uh, us, we need to show ourselves, we need to show our communities. And in this pandemic, um, you know, it's, I think it's just a hundred times more important. You know, our communities are dying and um, we don't have enough resources for them. We didn't have enough hospital space. We didn't have adequate hospitals and healthcare services. We didn't have um, food security and we still don't have these things. So the census Again, please count yourself. Let this, our government know that you are here, that you exist, and you deserve, um, deserve, uh, what is it? Oh, sorry, somebody came on. That you deserve uh, protection from your government. So yes, please, if you haven't done so already, as you walk down the street, remind everybody, did you fill out your census? Did you do it? Did you do it? Because it's really, really easy. There's so many more ways now, thankful to technology, that we can do it online, that we can do it, um, you know, the old ways by phone, by mail. But it is so important that our government knows who we are, that we exist, and that we need help, and that we need um, protection. Thank you. And in addition to being counted, to be uh, another uh, huge right for our communities is the voting rights. And I know in the chat, uh, someone asked about voting rights and that was actually my next question. So let's get right in it. Assemblywoman Rosenthal, I wanna give you the opportunity to, to, uh, to take on this question. And I know both you and Senator Biagi and all of you were uh, strong advocates of like, let's move into the option of mail-in voting. Uh, but how, are, how do we keep New Yorkers informed? I could tell you that when I'm phone banking for candidates and for other organizations that there's still confusion about the process, about what exactly they're getting in the mail, how do they participate. So I think there's a really um, a big concern, especially in communities that maybe English is not their primary language or they're just not uh, connected to, with technology to know that, hey, this is now an option. These are the steps that you need to do. So how do we um, uh, make sure that New Yorkers are informed about the voting process this year and avoid further disenfranchising vulnerable communities? So Assemblywoman Rosenthal, if you could get us started. <laughs> Okay, um, I just wanted to add to Assemblymember Fernandez, um, the census also determines our population and whether we gain or lose representatives in Congress. Um, and we, we are losing, so that's why it's so important that everyone fill it out so we can 
show our real strength and um, not lose members of Congress because then we lose our abilities to negotiate for ourselves in DC. In terms of voting, New York has been backwards for many years and we're finally with the Democratic Senate um, making some progress. So um, whether it's voting early for the first year, we got 10 days lead in to vote early. Uh, not enough sites, but we still gave people the opportunity. Mail-in, um, it's a constitutional change, but it, you used to have to produce an airline ticket or a doctor's note to show why you couldn't come in. We're changing that, and that, in fact, is changing for this upcoming election. Um, the number of days you had to reside in your district before you could register changed. Um, also, um, if you voted in another state, you'd have to re-register here. That is now automatic. There's a whole list of things. But, you know, the Board of Elections is very, very dysfunctional. Um, it, it really needs an upgrade, and that's part of the problem. But another part is um, we see other states, like California, I believe, will be mailing a ballot to every person. Here we are mailing an application for a ballot. So people are confused about that. People are also confused about who is on the ballot because in the budget there was a provision um, that said that one that candidates running for president, I guess, or for other offices who were no longer really running did not have to appear on the ballot. So I think that confused people because um, that case went to court and two courts now have said, put them all back on. So people were, weren't were sure, was it just going to be Joe Biden or would every presidential candidate who qualified for the ballot in New York and their delegates appear on the ballot? So finally, the State Board of Elections is not appealing the final decision. So every candidate will be on the ballot. Um, there's also the usual ballot skirmishes, like who's on, who got enough signatures, but that happens every every election. I think that people need um, a trusty, a trustworthy source of information about voting. Um, we see that the president of the United States wants to penalize states that allow mail-in ballots, lying and saying that that is voter fraud. I mean, you can't even wrap your head around these lies. Um, but some of that filters down and people, people get confused. So first of all, the Board of Elections needs to put a lot more information on its website. Um, I passed a few laws about that, um, that it's, it hasn't been uh, available for people with uh, visual or other impairments, people who couldn't see it um, properly. It wasn't ready for them. Um, that I changed that in a in a in a new law. Um, also, you can never find out who is on the ballot because they take their sweet time putting up each eligible candidate. So I passed something to change it, but it is a bureaucracy. It is hard to navigate, and both Assembly and Senate are working to fix that. But, you know, progress is slow in this area. And, and, you know, a lot of people have been afraid that if you could register on the same day as vote, that people would infiltrate districts and try to flip them against incumbents. I mean, all sorts of crazy theories that don't really bear out. Um, but I agree, it's very confusing. And so we as electeds are sending out lots of messages saying, apply for your ballot to ensure that everybody has the vote. Um, but there needs to be a lot more information and education out there. And I think, you know, different levels of government are giving out the right information. And that needs to happen more. Thank you so much. Um, there was a follow-up question, and Senator Biagi, I saw that you unmuted yourself, so I'll definitely give you a chance to also address this question. The follow-up was uh, whether, 
it would be okay for community groups or for volunteers to um, to help people request their absentee ballots or complete the not the ballots but the application uh, to help oh, people out. What? Sure, sure. I mean, you have you should do it with the person. You shouldn't request it on their behalf um, unless they authorize you to. But it's really very simple, and it takes like two seconds. Right. So. Um, in addition to us requesting it, the Board of Elections is supposed to mail us our, our um, application as well. So if you ask, you should get that, and you should also get something mailed in by the Board of Elections with a, with a stamped envelope so you don't have to pay. That was another thing that is true. When you mail in your completed ballot as an um, absentee ballot um, voter, you had to pay you had to put your stamp on it, which is contrary to, you know, voting should not cost you anything. But so you can yeah. fill it out for a person, they, and, but they should be getting one on their own. And for people who have quarantined themselves outside of their usual domicile, they should request one for the address at which they are right now, and then they can get it sent. Um, although hopefully by June, people, should be back for those who are Thank you fortunate so enough to leave. Thank you so much for, ask, for answering that follow-up question. I believe Senate Majority Leader Sue Cousins has to leave us soon, correct? Yes, so I do. I, I, and, you know, I really, uh, again, this is, um, you know, how we do things. And it's good to meet uh, so many different people and, again, be involved in hopefully inspiring, which is what you do, inspiring uh, women to run and for women who are in you know these positions to hopefully model and 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 create access and information and just the understanding that we have so much to contribute and so much to give there were a couple of things i heard and just in the expanded conversation about the census i only represent westchester i know you did you said part of westchester i only represent westchester but when I first ran, I represented a district that was in the form of a rectangle. 10 years ago, when the lines were redrawn after the census, the Republicans who were in charge and have always on the Senate side been in charge of drawing the lines, decided to create a gerrymandered district and gerrymandered districts all over the state. So my district is now still number 35, but it is the smiling profile of an old man with a scraggly beard. No longer a rectangle. I have half of Yonkers, three quarters of White Plains, half of New Rochelle. It is cut and sliced and In addition, when I first ran, there were 62 senators. There is now 63 because that was a convenient way for them in their mind to keep the majority. So not only is it about, as, as, as you know, Assemblywoman Fernandez spoke about, not only is it about our services and like Senator, Assemblywoman Roosevelt talked about, it uh, also impacts Congress and our congressional representation, but it also represents the strength of the voices in communities that when they're not packed, when they're not cracked, when they're not dispersed, so to allow for certain uh, political persuasions to have more power than other. If we are just allowed to draw our lines in our full strength, we don't have to gerrymander and people will be heard and represented in ways that they should be. Extremely important. So that's why the census is important. That's why redistricting is important because it happens right after the census and we've got to care about that. So uh, I do want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to spend the time. I'm looking forward to spending more time with all of us for people to dare to run and to be able to be, you know, hopefully a mentor and uh, a supporter of great women, like my colleagues here, uh, to be able to, to represent their constituencies. So thank you very, very much. And I will talk to you later and uh, see you next week when we're we're passing those bills. Hopefully, you'll be watching. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Senator, thank you, thank you so much.
Senator Biagi, I know that you have to also uh, leave us soon. So I wanted to pivot the conversation to a different topic uh, that I know you're pretty passionate about and that's environmental justice, uh, especially because we know that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on low income communities, communities of color. We also know that there's air pollution, contamination, other environmental hazards that contribute to higher rates of asthma, respiratory illnesses that of course make people more vulnerable to COVID-19. So with that background, uh, where does environmental justice, climate change fit into this larger conversation about recovering from COVID? And uh, what are the potential consequences of not incorporating environmental justice in this recovery? So, I mean, you basically hit the nail on the head. Like the, the situation that we're in right now, as well as the fact that I represent a majority of the Bronx and a portion of Westchester County. And so what that has meant is, and also because the majority leader just talked about how our districts are very gerrymandered, my, when you, if you look at the shape of my district, it makes absolutely no sense other than to the person who previously represented it. It was drawn perfectly for that person, um, and that is it. So what I'm trying to tell you is that um, I have been able to see this crisis and, and the really terrible outcomes of this crisis um, through the lens of two different worlds, right? If you compare Pelham to the South Bronx or the East Bronx or the Southeast Bronx, it's like two different worlds are going on at the same time. But we already knew that. Those of us who have had our eyes wide open understand what has been going on and for how many decades before I was, I was even born, these things were going on. And so with COVID-19, you could basically draw a direct connection between the pollution that has poured into communities in the South Bronx um, and as a result of the high asthma rates and other comorbidities that are linked to um, a lot of the different pollu pollution um, measures and the devastation that has been brought by COVID-19, including environmental justice and our COVID, COVID response, um, which has been really, uh, to be honest with you, um, I think lacking. And even though you know each and every one of us has done everything we can on the ground to make sure that we're filling those gaps, um, what, has, what is very, very clear to me is that this moment right now is a moment that represents this transformational opportunity to build back up systems that have never been built before because we're watching systems crumble. We're watching our healthcare system crumble. And, and these things have already had massive cracks inside of them already. Our housing system crumble. We're watching as uh, our, our school systems are not even able to bring and, and weren't able and still not able in some areas to bring education to certain um, students who live in certain zip codes. The structural change um, that we are going to need to take place in our economy, to move away from all of these systems, but especially, to answer your question, uh, from polluting sources of energy um, to smaller scale strategies is just like essential. And you know, last year in, this, in the Senate we passed, it's, it's always good to talk about what we've done, but it's not good, I don't think, to rest your laurels on it. So yes, we passed the CLCPA, it's the strongest climate bill in the country, very good. We should clap one time because you know what? And Assemblywoman Rosenthal mentioned it, and I have to say it, because we beat California finally to one thing, which we rarely do in the state of New York. But the thing, the, the reality is we have to keep going, right? And so what we've seen in terms of the environmental impact is true across all of New York City. Uh, people of color, low-income New Yorkers are more likely in areas with high levels of pollution to have comorbidities. Um, breathing in polluted air every single day has led to different kinds of health problems. And we just recently saw a study from Harvard uh, University, the public health school, um, discuss how someone who has lived in an area of high levels of um, a certain matter, it's called particulate matter, is 15%, 15% more likely to die from COVID than someone who has lived in an area with one unit fewer one unit fewer of this specific type of pollution. So people who are exposed to these high levels of pollution are more likely to develop the kinds of lung and heart conditions that make COVID more deadly. And air quality is, by the way, not the only issue. The Bronx has been the, a, a very long time victim of disinvestment. So, you know, we've heard a lot from our leaders at the highest levels of our government, our governor, our mayor talk about so interesting, I can't believe these communities over here, how they could be impacted like this. No, they're the ones who have, not, who have not invested in these communities. So many of our communities lack access to fresh food, 
to healthcare, um, which also contributes to worse health outcomes and increases their risk of COVID. And so it's, it's like this disinvestment has led to the structural racism in our state. And it's not it's not gonna change overnight. It's gonna take us making bold decisions after this is done to rebuild a different system. We know that pollution can stunt lung growth, trigger asthma attacks, exacerbate heart disease, um, cause developmental problems. The EPA also, and I'm, I will wrap this up, estimates that 17,000 schools across the United States are located next to roads with heavy traffic, with children from low income and minority groups disproportionately put at risk. California is the only state in the United States to ban the construction of a school on the cheap land found beside major highways. We need to do that in New York too. And so we've, if we learn from this crisis and we actually are going to put our, our money where our mouth is, going to the first question you asked me about our budget, our budget will then reflect investing in the communities that have been disinvested in for decades because this crisis has just blown the lid off of the system that we know um, and, and have grown up with. And I think it's time to shift. Thank you so much, Senator Biagi. I don't know if you noticed some people were clapping uh, as you were speaking, especially when you said about bold proposals, structural change, and what and, and investing in our communities. I understand that you have to jump off now, but I wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us today, uh, for being so forthcoming about you know with your answers and just telling it like it is. Uh, we look forward to seeing the great work that you'll continue to do in the Senate. And um, thank you so much for your support of Dare to Run. Thank you for having me. And if there's anyone who's watching who is thinking about running, needs help in their race, whatever it is, please reach out because that is what we're here for. I wish so much that I had a young woman in office who I could have looked up to or could have reached out to. Um, we might not know all the answers, but we might know a little bit of something that can help you along the way. And that is what it is all about. So thank you for having me. And I look forward to having the conversation um, in, in the future again soon. Thank you, Senator thank you. Biagi. Thank you. Um, Assemblywoman Rosenthal, I know that you've also been a champion for environmental justice and climate change uh, uh, proposal. So if there's anything else you want to add to what Senator Biagi said, I wanted to give you that opportunity before we move on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to emphasize how it's been years of putting, um, putting garbage dumps, um, construction debris, bus depots, anything that rich people would not want cited in their district in poor minority communities. And, you know, it's, it's environmental justice that people have been fighting for for years. And I think it's finally taking hold, but it, um, how many people have suffered with lung disease um, for years growing up? Um, how about the mold in NYCHA housing? How about the, um, you know, there are, there are uh, monitors like in, in the top of Manhattan, Washington Heights where a lot of low-income people live. The, the air there is saturated um, with contaminants and the children have more asthma in those neighborhoods. I mean, it's just a, a cycle and it has to stop and I think it's starting to stop, but it's starting to penetrate how this whole system, the way Senator Biagi was, was talking about, has been has been broken for years. It just took this. It took a number of things. One, the election of Trump, uh, which has really thrown the whole country off balance. But then, put on top of it, COVID nineteen, and that has laid bare the problems with healthcare and with housing and with food insecurity. And now we see it. It's all there for us to see, and it's up to us in the legislature to seize the moment to change it. And there are a lot more groups out there advocating for this kind of um, environmental justice in this case, uh, the rent justice. Um, there, there are a lot more people out there who are anxious to change the system, which just helps all of us, gives us the backing and the encouragement to do it. Thank you so much, Emily uh, Woman.
I want to now uh, talk about the other effect of COVID. And we all are familiar with the physical impact. There's also a mental health impact. And Assemblywoman Fernandez, uh, you're a member of the Committee on Mental Health, and you've advocated for breaking down the stigma about mental health. So tell us what can the state do or is doing to support people who are struggling with mental health during this pandemic? Um, well, thankfully, the state has taken some actions. I, I hope we've seen Governor Cuomo's uh, partnership with Head Start and every New Yorker getting um, a free membership or you know access to the app to, to help with uh, our mental health needs right now. And it's really important to keep this conversation prominent now and later because the effects to our adults, our, our teens, our children, our seniors, every essential worker, literally everyone is having an impact on their mental health and the strain can be very detrimental. I've seen reports of some suicide attempts already, some um, that, that did you know go through and it's scary. Um, and for the communities that are heavily, heavily impacted and I speak for the minority community, which is why this is such a, a important issue to me, is because the stigma is, I think, 10 times stronger in minority communities. Um, I know personally myself, growing up as a Latina, it's, it's just kind of in us and raised, you know, to, to tough it up. You can handle it. Don't, don't, you know, let this bother you. Just move on, do your job and whatever. And, you know, now more than ever, we need to let people know it's okay to, to ask for help, to show that you need help and, and to offer help if you're, if you're able. Um, so the state has hotlines. There are hotlines available now. And, you know, those are very helpful. Um, I did a support a bill actually with Carmen uh, Arroyo right before the pandemic that would change the, the state suicide hotline to 899, 811? Oh my God, 899. <laughs> yeah. Um, to, to make it quicker and easier because you know, we never know what is the moment that that person is going through and the help just needs to be immediate. But we need to understand um, how and why, um, you know, this is affecting us. And I've seen it in, I think, different levels. Um, you know, I, I broke it down before, our seniors, our children, our everything. And we have to start planning to how we're going to incorporate mental health assistance into the reopening, into our rebuilding and our restart. Um, you know, we've spoken before how we need counselors, social workers in our schools, and I think that's going to be needed in all levels. Sorry, my cat knocked something down. Um, especially for, you know, every edge, I'm sorry, really distracted me. <laughs> but we need to incorporate mental health needs in everything. I've been speaking to small business owners, I've been speaking to educators, um, institution leaders, and within their staff and their clientele, the help is needed. So within HR or whatever um, employee uh, guideline that we're rebuilding, we should be incorporating mental health needs and awareness and giving resources up front and letting them know. But as individuals, and this is something that I, I noticed uh, in my role right now as an assembly member, just... Uh, wellness checks. Wellness checks are very, very important. I can't say how many, particularly seniors that, you know, have reached out saying, I need help. And when we go through the list, they're like, okay, but we can sign you up for food here. We can get you this, sent you there. We can get you this, this, this. And it ends up that they just wanted somebody to talk to. So mm -hmm. it's, it's important for, as neighbors, as friends, you know, if we can understand that this is an issue, this is a problem, make sure that you're acting in a way and, and, projecting information uh, to the general public around you that it's okay to be feeling in some sort of way. And it actually happened to me uh, personally, directly. Like I, I was in the store or I was coming out of the store and I tripped, I dropped something, it fell to somebody's foot and I went to get it and I got a little too close. And in coming up, I think my purse maybe, um, you know, hit their bag and the person got very, very agitated. So like immediately I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like it was an accident. I really didn't mean it. I didn't mean to drop it there, whatever, whatever. But then I saw that the person had a tag as a healthcare worker and they were like, I'm sorry, I'm just on my way to work and I'm, I'm already tense. So, you know, immediately then I'm like, I, I feel for you because I can't imagine what you're thinking or, or going through just knowing what you're going to be walking into into the hospital and what you're going to be enduring and then coming home to your family. You know, we heard that there was um, 
essential workers that were sleeping in their cars because they're afraid of infecting their families. And I think it was Senator Bernardis that uh, introduced a bill to provide them with housing, temporary housing in this time. So there is no fear of that um, and the extra protection. But the conversation, huh? Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Um, but I, I think the state is aware, you know, certainly the governor, he, he is repeating in his messaging that we are in a state, a mental health crisis right now. Um, but there is a lot more that we can do. And, you know, some of it will come to getting funding to provide these resources in our institutions, in our schools, um, and in our workforce that can help us get through and back to a place that is good. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. We are running out of time, so I'm going to just ask two more questions, one each, and then uh, I'm still keeping track of the chat and trying to incorporate people's questions into my questions as well. Uh, so this is going to be for Assemblywoman Rosenthal. Uh, it's about, we talked about anxiety, and one of the sources of anxiety is how do I pay my rent? You know, this is an ongoing conversation. We know that the governor has issued an eviction moratorium, but that expires June 20th, and the one that he extended is uh, it's a it's not as um, as broad as the one that uh, expires on June 20th. And we know that there are several proposals calling for rent cancellation, mortgage forgiveness, and other remedies to alleviate uh, the financial impact on tenants, small landlords, and small business owners. That's a lot. But Assemblywoman Rosenthal, if you can, and maybe like. 90 seconds, two minutes or less. Tell us uh, what do you think is a path of going forward to help people who are struggling to pay their rent? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, landlords cannot expect to get the rent paid when the tenant has no job. Unemployment is not enough to cover it, and they need to stop harassing tenants, which I've heard is happening. So eviction stopped till June 20th the broad order till August 20th, but is not as good. And indeed, landlords are currently trying to find ways and they're being allowed to proceed with prior evictions that started before um, COVID. So it's a very scary time. What we need is that rent, the person will never make that money back. You know, so many people in the state are rent burdened. So we need money from the federal government um, to do that. But I believe in instituting taxes on the 112 billionaires in our state and the multimillionaires can pay a little more and then we can help people out to pay their rent, to pay their mortgage. The banks are always taken care of. They can forgive mortgage um, payments. Um, it's, the, it's the tenant and the small landlord, very small, like one building, two buildings who will suffer because they have to pay their taxes. So we need to infuse them with money. We need to give them money, which the federal government can print, um, to, pay, to pay what they need to until the economy starts up again. Thank you very much. I wanted to draw people's attention to the chat. There was a link uh, provided for a forum uh, tomorrow that Assemblywoman Fernandez as well as Senator Biagi are co-sponsoring about mental health because that's obviously a discussion that needs a lot more than just two or three minutes. So uh, the link is there where you can register. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing it. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a great conversation tomorrow. So my last question uh, is going to be for Assemblywoman uh, Fernandez. I want to talk about the digital, the digital divide, but as it applies to education. So now that, um, and I saw that your office had announced a grant to the Bronx Community College of $125,000 to provide uh, remote devices for students uh, temporarily during COVID. And I think that just kind of goes back to not everybody has the same access to technology, and this contributes to a widening gap uh, on the educational front. So then uh, the question is, what do we need to do to make sure that children at all levels are are getting, receiving the education that they're entitled to, especially if we're moving to a more remote type of learning uh, setting. Every kid needs uh, a tablet, basically. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten it from my constituents that I, you know, I haven't been able to check my kid into class or they couldn't do the assignment because I needed the tablet for work or my other kid needed it. So really to, to make it as simple as possible we need to provide a piece of technology and access to the wi-fi because you know not everybody has that access or is it um you know available in their regions i know upstates there's areas that don't even have you know broadband 
Um, but we need to be able to provide that help and extra training for parents. You know, there are parents too that this was dropped on them and as much as our curriculums are changing and evolving, I'm sure that there's parents looking at math and how the lessons are being done now, completely different than how they used to do it when they were a kid. So aside from support to our kids, giving them the material, literally, we need to support our parents in, in understanding what they need to do and helping if they can't do it because there are single parents that are trying to work at home and teach their kid and still take care of the home, feed their kid, all that. And there's children that, you know, maybe in environments where they just don't have the focus or the ability to focus at the home, you know? So funding again, money, and I agree, let's tax those billionaires because if our federal government is going to take longer than they already have been, then we need to take action and do what we can do. And that is revenue raisers. So um, really getting every bit of material to our kids I think is really important and for our college kids that was something that um, I was I feel luckily able to do because I had the capital funding still available you know we only get a certain amount and when BCC Bronx Community College you know uh, told me that we have a, a large amount of students that really relied on the campus uh, equipment you know with the computer lab and everything that they need help you know, I jumped to it. I was able to do it. Um, but I know that that's probably still not going to cover the amount of people and not even students, but, you know, adults that are in their education um, right now that are doing, taking, going through pursuing their education right now um, that need the help. So, yes, let's get everybody technology. It's the 21st century. Should all Thank be. you. Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of everyone's time since we're already at seven o'clock. I'm already hearing all the clapping and noise outside, which right. I love. Yes, let's do a round of applause. Everybody join in. Yes, uh, for our essential workers. Uh, I want to thank again Assemblywoman uh, Rosenthal and Fernandez for joining us today as um, everybody probably uh, took from this conversation that so many different topics that all intersect with co like COVID impacts everything from education to housing, environmental justice. There are other topics that we didn't have time to cover today. And there's just so much. Um, so thank you for our assembly uh, woman for being champions of our community for doing the hard work, uh, either in Albany or remotely, <laughs> making sure that our communities are well represented. Before we sign, we sign off, just two things. Uh, one, for anybody who wants to learn more about Dare to Run and is interested about how to apply or wants to know how to support our organization, you can stay on for a few more minutes and I'll be happy to answer questions and just talk about the organization. Uh, for Assembly uh, Women Rosenthal and Fernandez, in 30 seconds or less, I had class of 2020, but since I think most of us have graduated, um, maybe your words of wisdom to women or people who are interested in running for office that you can uh, impart us with. Uh, Linda, I'll let you go first. See you <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so first of all, you see men with no experience and no reason say, I'm going to run and I'm going to win. Women take much longer to figure it out and to have the confidence to go out there, raise the money, present themselves and, and say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to win. That was certainly true with me. Um, so first of all, you can do it. Believe in yourself. Uh, you don't have to be smarter than the men because, you know, you probably are already. Um, but just have confidence that you have something to contribute and do not be swayed by those who wanna turn your path elsewhere. Um, you can do it, you can ask for money, you can be a great legislator and you can represent your community as well and at times even better than those who aren't women. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, well, to the ladies running, yes, believe in yourself, Lo know your worth and, and love yourself enough that you know the community will. But like Linda said, um, you have something to contribute. You, you have uh, yourself, your knowledge, your, your experience, whatever your story is, it's important and it matters. And I know it matters to many people, if not someone out there. And if you really feel you're not good enough, if you really feel like you're not smart enough, if you really feel like, wow, I can't, I, I'm just not that person, look at our president of the United States. If he did it, <laughs> if he did it, then you can 
absolutely do it. And oh, you boy. will get way more support. That's the silver lining of him winning the presidency. It's like, if he can do it, all of us can run for office. <laughs> and honestly, that was my motivation because I was one of those people that I was like, no, why me? Like, I, I'm not, I don't know everything. I can't do it. And, you know, I'm so grateful to my community for really encouraging me. And yeah, they told me many times, do it, do it, do it. And finally I did it because I was angry that he won. And I'm like, really? This guy we think can lead the country? Then I can totally lead this district. Fine. <laughs> Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for those uplifting, encouraging words. Uh, I'm going to stay on. Rochelle's going to stay on for a little bit longer for anybody else who wants to uh, chat a little bit more about our organization and our program. Uh, thank you again to both Assemblywoman Rosenthal and Fernandez. Keep doing great work, and I'm sure we'll see each other again soon, and hopefully in person. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. You. Be safe and thank be well. Thank okay. you. Bye. Okay, so um, I know some people would drop out, so I'm just gonna give another minute for if anybody wants to stay on. <laughs> and they're dropping like flies, Zeta. What's going on here? <laughs> I won't scare yeah. them all away. That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so we do have a few people who are, who, are stay, who are stay with us. All right, good. So thank you so much for joining us for this program. Um, I am uh, proud to be a board member of Dare to Run. Dare to Run was founded by Rochelle, so Rochelle's our founder and CEO, so big kudos to her. Um, Thank you. <laughs> what is there, you know, maybe we, you could tell, like, what, why you decided to found this. You're the founder. Like, what motivated you? Yeah, I mean, so for me, you know, years and, you know, when I was a young girl, I guess this started in my youth. When I was a young girl, I was raised by a single mother, like many of us, and I watched my mom struggle. I watched her struggle, you know, to collect child support from my father, which he didn't want to pay, like many men, unfortunately, and some women too, but mostly men, let's call a spade a spade here, right? <laughs> so he didn't want to do that. You know, that was a struggle. You know, my childhood, things were very difficult. She had to work two jobs to take care of me. You know, income was always an issue for us. And, you know, I very often I would hear statements made during the Clinton administration and during a lot of administrations, you know, kind of geared towards unifying the Democratic and Republican Party and bringing everybody together. But really, the perspectives that were being shared were not uh, from females, right? They were from a, a male-oriented perspective. And as you mentioned, Etta, as many of our panelists tonight mentioned, women offer a different perspective. They bring a different perspective to the table when they decide to run and they decide to do their campaigns. And so for me, I, you know, from a young age, I saw the impact that women could make. I saw, my, I watched my mother take care of me. I watched her struggle to go to work and take care of me with precious little help from my grandparents who were great people. God bless them. May they rest in peace. But you know, it's really difficult when you're a single mother and you're struggling and you have to battle for food stamps or welfare. You have to battle for child support. These things should not be a battle. And so for that, and for many reasons, we need a lot more women in government because women see things from a different point of view. They see things from a different angle because they're the, they're the majority of single parents, they're the majority of ch people raising children on their own. So they bring a fresh perspective, they bring a perspective that unfortunately a lot of men, it's not that they don't understand it, but, but they don't experience it. And so their way of dealing with that situation is fundamentally different. So for me, I think bringing more women to the table at all levels of government is something that we desperately need and we can benefit from as a society. So that's what I, my goal with Dare to One was to train as many women as possible, to give them the first step, to give them the foundation and all the tools and all the knowledge they need to run for office. So it's really, for me, I love education. I love knowledge. You know, my background is Jewish. So we're big bookworms. We're big avid readers. We love education. Not to say that others don't, but historically we're known for that. You know, we're being little bookworms and everything. So for me, I believe in the fundamental importance of education and giving women the tools that they need to be successful candidates. Everything that comes so naturally and so inherently to men, you know, I want to give to women and make sure they feel that same level of confidence when they run for office and they should. Thank you so much, Rochelle. You know, hearing like your personal story and what drove you to start Dare to Run uh, kind of gives me like a different perspective about the organization, how important it is. Uh, and I'm going to just say a few words and then I want to open it up to any questions or comments because this should be more conversational. But I, I want to uh, drive the point that who should run for office and that is all of you, everyone, right? A lot of people have this um, misconception that people run for office maybe from a little age, they were running for student government, they were poli-sci majors, and maybe they are, that's great. 
but we're also looking for nurses, for doctors, for teachers, for people who are in different professions because you bring, that's what we want, different perspectives. You know, we need people in Albany and DC and city council making decisions that understand how the law actually looks like in the real world and who it impacts. So when you have someone who's been an educator, lifelong educator, drafting legislation that's going to impact education or having a conversation about the budget, uh, that makes a difference. When you're talking about healthcare, universal access to healthcare, and you have people who have worked in hospitals and who have worked in nursing homes, who have been home healthcare aides, whatever it is, they bring a different perspective. So that's part of what our goal is with Dare to Run is to reach those women who maybe are thinking, well, that's not for me. Politics is not my thing. That's dirty. I'm not into politics. I haven't been in politics. That's okay. We, you have been a leader. You've been connected to your community. You have been providing to your family. And all of those skills and, and experiences makes you qualified to run for office. So that's, that's my spiel. Uh, and all of you are muted, but I think you could unmute yourself if you want to ask questions or you could put it in the chat or let me see. No, no questions on the chat. Um, we could talk about the program. Um, I think Linda, you unmuted yourself. Do you have a question? I don't want to put you on the spot. So anybody who has a question, feel free. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Selena Gray and I'm a com political community organizer with the New York State Nurses Association. Um, I live in Staten Island and I am running for office, but given the, the, the current environment that we in, the environment of COVID, raising funds and actually campaigning is a lot different than what I've ever seen. What or is Dare to Run going to do some type of webinar or Zoom to kind of assist candidates with having to raise money during this time. I'm not asking any of my constituents, my race is in 2021 mm -hmm. for money, but once we get past this, it's already hard for a woman to raise money because we never like to ask. So now I feel like I need to nurture because there are a lot of people hurting, but we know that that's not gonna win a race. Um, so can you give us your thoughts how to transition from that? Sure. I mean, and thank you, Selena, for joining the conversation. So I'll just talk briefly. One of the things that we're doing in light of COVID-19 and, and this current pandemic is that we are, for, um, for students who want to, for candidates who want to take the full training, we're offering free tuition for anyone who qualifies as an essential worker. So if you're an EMT, a first responder, a healthcare worker, a nurse, anyone who falls into that category, we're offering free tuition for you to be able to take the program this semester because we want you to run, we want you to win, and we want you to know that you have a community and resources that support you. So I would definitely encourage you to check out our website, daretorun.org slash apply now, and you'll see everything I just said is up there, apply now, and we have, uh, we're offering free tuition for everyone who provides, obviously, those credentials. So I would definitely encourage you to visit our website and, and fill out the application. It's due by July 31st, by the way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Celine, I definitely encourage you to uh, to look into the program. Uh, just personally, I could say that I, I've been working on a few different campaigns, uh, some for 2020. So they're in really tough time. They're in a tough position right now, but also for some 2021 candidates because we know that the filing deadline, the next one is July 15th or July 11th. Yes, we have to submit it to the campaign finance board. So you know, you're in a tricky position because you want to show uh, supporters. And, and organizations that want to endorse you that your campaign is viable. But at the same time, you don't want to be calling people right now and asking them for money. What I have seen has worked right now. Um, have you done any fundraising before COVID hit? Well, I've been a campaign manager for our current council member, Debbie Rose, the past oh. two years. I've always ran women. Um, I was the campaign manager for um, Pat Kane. And then the last race I did it was for Edwina Martin. So while that race was ending because it was contentious, I, did not, I didn't start my campaign until late because we had to contest absentee ballots. So I got off the ground late because I was committed to someone else. So um, I started my fundraising. and I only had one. So my July 11th is not going to be spectacular, but I have a lot of commitments. Those commitments are solid. 
but not during COVID. So that's okay. So Selena, I, I just want to, um, I, I want to mention that for women, because you said it's difficult for us to ask. And right now, maybe this is not the perfect environment to go calling a lot of strangers asking for money. It, it, because they're gonna be like, oh, this is the first time I hear from you and you're asking for money during a pandemic. I just lost my job. How yes. tone deaf are you? That is not the, not the uh, right tone to strike. But you will have, I'm sure you have a close group of friends. I think now is quality over quantity. Maybe your numbers are not going to be that great in the July 11 filing. But you could have your core supporters, maybe have like a small finance committee of people who are very committed to you. You know, all these people said they're committed. Maybe they could do small events. They could, they could call some of their friends and say, you know what? I know times are tough. If you can contribute $10, it'll we'll make a difference because we have to see how our our district is going to do for long term, right? I believe in Selena. So you need people who truly believe in you or invest it. And it's going to be more about the quality and having those conversations and also doing wellness checks. During our panel, uh, someone mentioned, I think it was Assemblywoman Fernandez about when she talked about mental health. When you're yeah. calling people, you always want to check in on them and not just like a perfunctory, like, hey, how are you? How, how are things going? It's like, how can I help you? Like, what are your needs right now? And maybe you don't ask for money in that initial conversation. You actually do some work. You connect them to a resource. You're helping them out, adding value to that relationship. Once you add a different kind of value, it makes it a little bit more organic to start asking for money, even in this time of like COVID-19. But I certainly understand the hesitation with what's going on in the city. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, it's tough right now. So we just need to get past this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for your input. I appreciate it. You're welcome. So I have some questions about the application. So um, I was at the Lunch and Learn, and um, I just wanted to know, because I know we were encouraged to be creative with the application, and there's a section in the application, kind of the last question, um, that says, um, you know, that basically it has a description about that, but there are, uh, when, while I was looking at the application, I saw that some of the short answers also have room to be uh, to add, to be answered creatively. So my question is, um, what's the flexibility with that? I know some there's uh, some word limits on um, the short answers, but if you want to answer those in a different format, just because maybe one example that I'm thinking is, you can answer a question giving a taste of what it would be like to have your constituents answer the question about you, for example. Um, so is there flexibility to answer those questions without using words or do, do we should I really be sticking to a format in the application? Uh, well, we so you know, and, and we, we talked about this in the lunch and learns and on the webinars, we encourage you to be as creative as possible. You know, so if you're submitting videos or photos or, or any kind of media or materials, just, just maybe put in one or two sentences, say my response is attached and so on and so forth. You don't have to go overboard, just something indicating how that, that question will be answered. That's all. You can, so you can respond however you like. I encourage you to be as creative as possible. Uh, and, I, and I like the idea of like storytelling too, you know, um, I think, uh, Successful candidates also do that, right? They create a story, they connect it, they show as opposed to just telling. Um, so if you have to go a little bit above the word uh, limit to be able to show, I, I would encourage you to do so. I have another question. <laughs> but I wanna give, if somebody else has a question, I don't wanna take over. Okay. Any questions, Tanya, Selena, Asia, Steph, and I don't know who's on iPhone. Josh, if you have questions. Actually, yeah, I have a question. Okay. Thank um, you. What can, what can those of us who I, are not running but want to support the mission, uh, what, is there anything we can do with Dare to Run as far as maybe connecting us with candidates or, or any other process? So thank you for that question, Josh. I actually got that question by someone else, a man also, who was like, I, you know, this sounds great, but I'm not gonna be applying for the program, so how do I help? I can tell you at least two ways, and Rochelle can uh, jump in and add anything, and Shannon, who's also one of our board members. Uh, so financially, that's a big way of contributing. We're in a 501c3, so obviously any donations are, you know, are charitable contributions. Uh, right now we're raising funds, as Rochelle mentioned before, for our um, applicants, 
who are accepted into the program who are EMTs, first, first responders, or healthcare workers like nurses, we're going to provide them free tuition. To do that, we need to raise money. So that's part of a good way to contribute. Second, if you know of any woman, you look at them, you're like, man, she should really run for office. Ta you know, this is what women need. A lot of times, uh, a, a lot of times women need to be asked. Uh, I think the actual statistic is seven times you need to be asked in order to run for office. So if you see someone who, who demonstrates leadership qualities, who you think maybe this person can run in a few years, even if it's not right now, or they're going to get involved in a campaign, tell, tell them about our program. We need, you know, we need to encourage people to apply to this program. And then third, yes, if you have any connection to elected officials that could help us with these type of programs that could expand the connections and that we can um, give to our, to our participants, that's certainly welcome. And Rochelle or Shannon, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, I'll just jump in and add that I, I shared two links in the chat. So the first link is how to donate via our website. So that's if you want to make a general donation to support Dare to Run, we would always encourage that. And the second link is, is a, a link to our scholarship fundraiser. So this uh, fund that we're doing, this fundraiser that we're doing on Facebook is specifically for EMTs, healthcare workers, first responders, anyone who falls into that category. So there's a, a very specific fundraiser set up on Facebook for that. So if you want to donate to either one of those, I just sent you guys the link. So please do that and support the people who put their lives on the front line for us during the COVID-19 crisis. So. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Josh. Um, Tanya, Asia, Steph, Ophelia, Selena, Dorian, any other questions? I know Dory has another question. She's trying, she's trying not to be a gunner like she was in law school. <laughs> <laughs> I hold back too. I hold back. I'm like, <laughs> what's your next question? So, um, I've heard a lot about the, the, the you know, the data run program, the cohort, cohort, and I was, I had the pleasure, um, Michelle let me sit in and just kind of like, see how it will go. I wanted to know a little bit more about what Theater Run does after to kind of like stay with these women and just support them in, during the process. Because um, one thing that I remember saying is that I don't necessarily know if I am ready to run, but I am very interested in politics and other positions that politics is really kind of like involved in, like a judgeship and things like that. So I wanted to know kind of like the con more about the continued relationship after the program. And is there one and, and what Theater Run does? Sure. So, um, you know, we do a number of things. So, you know, of course, after each cohort, after everybody graduates and moves on, we have a Dare to Run alumni network group, which is set up on Facebook. It's specifically for alumni members of the successive cohort. So right now we have six people in the Dare to Run alumni group. We encourage them to join, to share stories of their trajectories after they complete the program, if they decide to go on to run for office, if they don't, and kind of so on and so forth, what that looks like. So of our first cohort, we have two candidates who did run campaigns. So one is um, Sheba Simpson, who was on our call previously. She's currently running for city council. And we also have um, Giselle Burgess, who's the she works for the Girl Scout. She's the leader of Troop 6000, and she's currently running a campaign in Queens for Jimmy Van Bramer's seat. You know, mm -hmm. she made her formal announcement. So we do have about a 40% success rate. Of course, it's a small cohort, but we encourage everyone to be active and involved on Facebook. And, you know, we also have internships that we set up for women who complete the program, who once they complete the kind of the training part, they want to get the more hands-on experience of working in a female elected official's office. So we offer them that opportunity as well. And of course, mentorships. We're in the process of setting up internships and mentorship programs with female elected officials where they can do at this point, you know, because of COVID-19, they could do a Zoom call once or twice a month or weekly or however, you know, the kind of the schedule they work out. So we give women different opportunities to connect with elected officials once they complete the program. And we encourage them, of course, to stay connected with Dare to Run. So. Yeah, I mean, I think if anything, you saw Majority Leader uh, Stuart Cousins, you saw Senator Biagi, Assemblywoman's Rosenthal and Fernandez here. This is type of the connection, right? It's getting women, like putting them in the room and connecting them with people. So that's the benefit, the long-term benefit of you know going through this type of program. Thank you. I do have to jump off at 7.30. So I wanna make sure if there are any other questions. Um, that we take them. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. I hope that um, the links are on the chat for you to apply. 
Uh, you can also follow us on social media. I encourage that because we're probably going to do another lunch and learn at some point this summer uh, to you know talk a little bit more about the program, answer any questions that you might have after you look at the application. So follow us on Facebook, uh, Instagram. We're very active. Uh, I think even Twitter, but I don't know. I think Facebook and Instagram are the two main ones that we use. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there's a Twitter handle. I knew we had a Twitter too. <laughs> We're everywhere. Yeah. I can't keep track of everything, but it's good <laughs> to just follow because we'll have updates about the program, about any upcoming events. And I encourage you also to reach out to your friends, uh, anybody who might be interested. You know, the, the, the more we grow this program, the stronger it is. We're stronger when we have a community to support each other. So we want to grow this community. So thank you again for participating uh, tonight. I hope that you found the conversation uh, to be to be a good conversation, to be substantive. That was my goal, you know, uh, when we were preparing the questions, that was the goal to make it a substantive conversation. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at future Dare to Run uh, events. Thank you. Thank you everybody Excellent. for participating. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi, Josh. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> yeah, Josh. <laughs> you stayed until the end. Such a trooper. Yes, I'm impressed. St. Hey, John, St. John, strong. Hey. <laughs> oh, man. So when are you running? Uh, we'll talk about that off screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Good night. Good night.